first one has to do with discussing and clarifying the environment that we're trying to create with our teams and players and why. It's interesting, kind of spinning off of the, um, the interview we listened to last week from John Spira, and he talked about kind of dismantling some of the, I don't know, old world maybe thoughts about team environments, and, uh, and then following up with this article that just ran in Sports Illustrated in 28th of September about um, the special report on what Sports Illustrated called this abuse of power of coaches, right, and the environments that they're creating with their teams or have been. So <clears throat> I want this to be a real discussion versus you guys listening to me. So, you know, I want thoughts, I want opinions, I want, you know, some interaction with this, yeah. Um, and through this, we're going to try and really define clearly what and why. Um, what is the kind of environment we're trying to create and and why do we need to think this environment is so important to um, to create for our players. So <clears throat> any kind of general thoughts you had reading through the article, I mean, did it bring back some memories of being an athlete? I know it did for me. <laughs> so any any kind of first impressions, I guess. First impression is I remember saying that I think one of my early coaches said, perfect practice makes perfect. Well, that makes no sense. Like, that literally makes no sense, especially if it's something we're working on. So um, that was just something that, it's not gonna be perfect when you're practicing it because you probably have never looked at it before necessarily. So, uh, yeah, yeah, just initial thought. Okay, other initial thoughts or impressions? I have one from a long time ago. It's at high school and college, um, running cross country and playing tennis. Um, the way injuries were dealt with, which was primarily you know, just play through it, yeah. was the, the style at that point in time. And there are probably some injuries that I have long term and chronically now because I bought into that. Yeah. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Injuries is something they talked about, you know, pretty extensively in here, and just the environment that we as coaches can create around an injured athlete, and sometimes, you know, not even intentionally. And that's that's one of the elements that I want to talk about when we talk about the environment. Um, you two, any first impressions? It it just reminded me a lot of my college experience. My um, the coach that I had for the first three years, we, um, she felt that the best way to create a competitive team and a high level, high level of competition was to create competition within the team and create competition for the spots in a negative way. So she would pit us against each other. She would um, just create a lot of negative, a negative environment that really didn't do anything to help our team cohesion and and um, that was the way that she coached, and and it just it, it never created the level of competitiveness that she wanted. It just all created bad things. Yeah. Um, so a lot of that, um, just like verbal abuse and things like that, reminds reminds me a lot of some of the the tactics that she took that just were yeah. not helpful. I wonder if you shower. Um, I think just with the injury side of it, like all of, like the kid already feels the pressure yeah. to like want to play and already is upset and already is like trying to play through it. So mm -hmm. it, they don't need help <laughs> with that. Um, and then as like a thinking in college, like they're already concerned about like losing their spot and everything and like those dynamics don't need to be pushed in any way. They're already there. Right. So. Yeah, so a lot of things are inherent to the environment in athletics, and one of the things inherent is competition, competition for playing time. You know, I've never met an injured kid who didn't really want to be out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so from the injury standpoint, like, what do we think from the environment that we're trying to create with players revolving around the ideas of an injury. What do we know about that injured player in most instances? How do they feel? Upset. 
They're upset. What else? Frustrated. Frustrated. What else? Like they have no value to this. Like they have no value. That's great. Yeah. yeah. What else? Like worried that, like they worried about the time frame that they'll be able to come back and be more helpful. Worried whether they're actually going to get back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another, another emotion that I have experienced with players is they feel like they're letting the team down. And you also feel separated from yeah, the team. Great. Depression. Right. So <laughs> Hopefully not. Jeez. Those are all great. So a lot, a lot of negative going on when a kid's injured, right? So. What do those things, and we've all been injured, I'm sure, at different times in our careers, right? So we can relate to a lot of this stuff. So, you know, environments need to be managed is kind of one of my beliefs about coaching. So this is an environment. This is, these are feelings that are pretty inherent to the environment of an injured player. So how do we as coaches want to go about managing that environment? Of the injured player. Of the injured player. Um, Knowing that these things are all existing, right? Yeah. That's part of the environment. How are we going to manage it? Uh, I think just having a conversation of goal setting with the injured player and helping them understand the place they're in, the role that they can play, and that may look different, but emphasizing the importance of the team. And then, I mean, as an athletic trainer from a a rehabilitation aspect of things, just like setting goals in the rehab even, that they can feel like they're making progress and they can kind of measure to see why I am moving forward to try and show them that um, there is progress being made. Um, and then even, yeah, having, I mean, I feel like teams are always pretty understanding, but, um, helping them understand the player's new role and hey it may look differently but this is the goals that we've set and this is what she'll be doing he'll be doing etc yeah that's good what else i think with like the feeling like they have no value maybe when you're in games or competition settings to give them something specific that they are looking for whether it's on your side or on the other side if they're um, taking stats on the serve receive so they know they can tell who to serve or things like that so that they feel like they have a um, a role in the team winning they have a specific job um, that is tangible and you can see it so we don't have some place where they can contribute right they feel like they're contributing somehow it's gonna help fight against some of these things this, this is great what else I think go well, it, not just with injury, I think it's good that uh, a lot of coaches will, um, if for example there's, <clears throat> they're only using one setter and the, the backup setters really not get much, much call time if any and kind of knows it, um, a lot of coaches get the backup setter talking to the setter that's out there um, during timeouts. Um, or indeed if it's a middle that's not getting much playing time, third middle or whatever, uh, they have a role in terms of perhaps talking about their selections of shot or selections of set in conjunction with the coach. Yeah, that's great because really when we're talking about a kid who's injured, we're talking about a kid who is probably not playing at all. Well, a lot of these same emotions are going to be felt by kids who are not playing much, right, even if they're healthy. Right, so a lot of this is going to be inherent in that environment for that kid. So, yeah, we want to understand that's going to be there. So now, what are we going to do about it to manage it? And I agree with Steve's having really defined roles and having ways the kid can interact, um, like you guys are saying, with the injured kid, find a way to contribute to the team's success and just what's going on with the team, the development of the team too. Right. So, so it's not just injured players, it's kids who are not having much impact. And I think making sure it's really taking the emphasis off of the player and putting it on the team, mm -hmm. I think is just really huge, especially for your players who are extremely influential in your game um, and in your 
team dynamics, especially on the court, um, it's really easy for them to get in a place where, oh, it's all about me, poor me, yeah. um, really put the emphasis on this is what the team needs, this is what the team needs from you, yeah. um, and making sure it's not all about them. Yeah. One thing we, we generally do here at Front Range is to still expect the kid to be coming to practices as well as competitions. Um, because we have, with that expectation, there's an expectation that there are still ways they can be contributing to their team, that they're still a team member. Yes, and this, and this especially, this attendance thing goes to one of the things, the separation feeling that happens, right? And, you know, this attendance is something that I always try and play by ear with kids because of a kid in most instances, kids should be here, I think, if they're injured, right? But there are some instances where it doesn't make sense for the kid to be here, like a kid just had surgery, mm -hmm. just had surgery on her knee, just had it reconstructed, right? She's not walking yet, she's on crutches, we really want that kid here where she's more of a liability. No, but as soon as she's able, right, we want her here and being a part because the separated feeling is a, is a weird feeling that happens with an injured kid because in most instances I think we feel and we see teams rallying around that kid trying to accept the kid but the kid feels separated and she feels no value right so again going back to this whole idea of giving them a specific role is going to help kind of up their feeling of value and by expecting attendance in instances where it makes sense you're sending the message to the kid that we want you here we need you here but Again, finding some kind of role in practice for them um, because they're not going to know some of them, you know, especially if it's their first injury. They're just not going to know how to get involved. So, good. What else? What else? Think, what other things can we do to manage this environment? I'd like to get back to what Steve was saying about um, the, the backup role. Mm -hmm. um, is one of the quiet things that happens when, when a kid has that role is that they have to be mentally rehearsing them doing that job. So, and this is true for, for player injury as well, that one of the things we can do while injured is to be rehearsing what we're doing and creating what's called micro-muscle movement that actually is part of the rehabilitation process and helps, helps the players come back faster, um, helps them come back more completely after an injury. That's a good point. Because otherwise they're just going to check out mentally, you know? Yeah, I think trying to keep them engaged is important, like, especially in competition, to just to keep asking them, like, what are you seeing? What do you think could help the players in your position be successful? Just trying to um, find a way for them to still be learning something while they're on the side. This is fairly recent, and I can't remember exactly the source but somebody recently I heard say that it's really important that you as a coach have a backup plan for any possible scenario that might happen in terms of your best setter being hurt all of a sudden, your, your, your right side hitter suddenly turns an ankle and you suddenly have to go to a 6-2 or you have to have a plan to deal with whatever, say I lose my best hitter, what's my plan, rather than doing it on the spur of the moment. And I think the way that our, our practices are organized, the way we try and get kids, especially in all of our game-like situations on the court, to our wave drills, making sure everybody plays everywhere, I feel like that really helps out a lot significantly. I mean, that happened with me, I had an injury, and it's not like I didn't have like I didn't have kids that were necessarily maybe as skilled as a player that I had on the court most of the time. But at the same time, they weren't completely foreign to what we're doing and right. and to what is expected of them when they're on the court because they've been in those situations and practice multiple multiple times. So yeah, yeah. So there's some things that we do already that are going to help this kind of stuff, right? And this is where the hyper specialization of kids, I think, like works against this kind of deal right because if we are letting kids do multiple things if middles are also playing right sides if lefts are also playing right if setters are also hitting left and playing middle when we're doing competitive type things at times and it's easy to draw the correlation that you know oh she's out well we practice you doing this 
even though it's not your main thing, right? So the familiarity that, that exists there um, makes any moves like that um, not, just, not just more possible, but just something that's uh, more familiar, right? We know familiarity is a big deal when it comes to making adjustments. I'm trying to think, there's a couple other things that I've experienced with players when they are injured slash coming off an injury. And <clears throat> a lot of it has to do is as they return to play, um, they end up having a feeling of, uh, of their play being so low. And it's not very realistic. They, the, my experience has been that kids who get injured, when they start coming back to play, they compare themselves currently to their best level, mm -hmm. right? And that's, it's, it's, a, it's a headspace that we have to kind of help work them out of, mm -hmm. right? Because it's okay that you're not as good as you were a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, whatever. You are where you are right now, and we're gonna work you from here. And, and, it, and it's, been a, it's been death to a couple of our top kids who came off major injuries like they could not get out of this headspace of comparing themselves to where they currently are to where they were their best, you know? And it's one thing to hold it out there as a carrot and say like, you can get back to that level. It's a whole nother thing to accept that, you're, that you feel so off that level right now. And that's an okay place to be. I think one of the things in, in managing this environment has got to do with how much you guys interact or we interact with them as coaches. <coughs> And I think there's, um, so I'll just put, we need a high level of coach interaction with injured kids, especially, um, well, almost, at almost any level, right? Think about the 14 and under kid, Taylor, right? Hurt foot last year, right? So that was Taylor, right? Oh, yeah. Hurt foot last year. She was as much an obstacle to eventually coming back because she was always trying to do more than she probably should have. Right? I had a situation developed with Tony last year where she stepped off a curb during the Kansas City tournament and developed like a really bad strain in her foot. <clears throat> she couldn't play at the event, came back and wanted to practice. And you know, I said to her, so what's up, what do your therapist say about this? Well, I can, I can play as long as it doesn't hurt. I said, does it hurt? She says, yes. I said, then you can't play, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> right? We get this, right? So, <clears throat> so it's really important to interact at a high level with these guys, one, to find out what is going on with their rehab if we're not managing the rehab. <clears throat> Two, to really clarify for them, like what are our expectations? Most athletes will view themselves, if they're holding themselves out of practice, as being weak in some case, right? So that's another element that we're dealing with up here, right? Um, weakness. That they feel or are afraid of being perceived as being weak. So <clears throat> we've got to kind of take some of this stuff off their plate, right? It's not your decision that you're being out. It's my decision that you're out. Or it's your therapist's decision that you're out. And I will reinforce that decision. We kind of take the athlete kind of out of the loop of that. Like you don't get a say in this because of what we know about your situation, right? Um, <clears throat> so high level of coach interaction, and it it's a little bit counterintuitive, I think. Um, but the thing I have found with injured kids is that the more you're interacting with them, it starts to erase a bunch of those feelings. Yeah, they can be frustrated, but if you're letting them know that they're not letting the team down, that this is outside of their control, eventually they'll start to believe it. If um, you're letting them know that it's not a sign of weakness to be held out of practice in, in these circumstances, eventually they'll start to believe it. Um, if you're letting them know that you're kind of in this process with them, as opposed to them kind of being alone, like in the process with them and that we're gonna support them as coaches, right? <clears throat> then it starts to alleviate some of these things that they can feel. It's not that we can eliminate all these things. We're not gonna eliminate frustration. We're not gonna eliminate depression. We're not gonna eliminate all these things. But we can manage as much as we can manage and influence the situation as much as we can. And we wanna make sure we do that. It's like some kids seem like they're fine. You might feel like, oh, they don't need my interaction. Well, you don't know. So we need to like interact with them anyway, right? And just continue to reinforce the message. But it's important because, you know, it's like 
we've got this kid, she wants to play, she feels she'll show weakness if she doesn't play, and we, we've just got to step in front of the bullet, you know, we've got to say, this is my call, it's like, here's what I know from your doctor or your therapist or whatever, and it's like it's out of your hands, you know, and trying to educate them to, to how to be like a responsible athlete, a responsible member to the team, you know, we need you back, we need you back when you're ready to come back, you try and come back too soon, the odds are you're going to be out again. You know, so, and they're, and they're not going to know. I mean, they're kids, they're not going to know. A lot of times we'll be dealing with a kid's first injury of her career. Mm -hmm. So she won't know how to deal with that. So we've got to kind of help them, kind of talk them through it and, you know, reassure them that um, not only is this okay, but like this is what we expect here. You know, we expect you to be out until you're ready to go. You know, if your therapist says, hey, you can jump 20 times tonight and you feel great after the 20th jump, we're still gonna stop at 20 because you gotta report that to your therapist and then they can start ramping you back up, right, so. Do you think it's like important to address it to the team with the player because like if you've been injured, you know that like you're not practicing and then one kid comes up, why are you practicing? And then the next kid comes up, why are you practicing? And like that gets old really fast. And um, and each of their teammates are forming their own, own opinion. So it's nice to just say, hey, I, I told Sally that she was injured and she can't play today. Her, um, her role is to do rehab and get back as fast as she can. She's disappointed that she's not playing with you, but you know we decided that it's best for her to sit out and that's her priority right now. Or just somehow address it so that the team knows she wants to be there, she knows the team knows she wants to be there, yeah. and, um, and that it was really your call as the coach that she's not playing because it, you think her safety is more important than anything else. And I think that's a good message to send to the player and to the team. Yeah. I think another thing that's uh, really uh, something that different players deal with in a different way, that players have had to come back from an injury and be wearing knee braces for the first time. And the way they deal with that from a mental aspect, some are scared to death they're going to do something again. Some can't wait to get the thing off their leg, and that's their goal. But I think uh, different players deal with it in different ways, and um, I'm, fortunately I've never experienced it, but I don't know how some of these players do deal with it. When I see the, the size of the knee brace that they're wearing, I think, holy moly, how are you even playing in that? But I, think, I think that brings up like a really interesting point because I mean, as a, as a therapist or as an athletic trainer, your goal is to get them accustomed to anything. Like, a, like, so, like so if I, have a, if I tear my ACL and I have a brace, I should never be stepping in the gym, putting on that brace and wearing it and playing in it for the first time. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous to me. Um, and I can think of girls this last year even who underwent constructions and in their therapy they had no functional movement done whatsoever it was all just strengthening which yeah muscle strength is great but um, yeah you, you have to you have to add a functional aspect to what you're doing or else it will be extremely frustrating and scary for the girls or I guess yeah guys it can be too but um, yeah and, and I think that's where our job is coaches um, is also important if we if we see that uh, not just throwing them in somewhere because yeah, yeah just that's so that's scary for me to even think about if there's a girl who's not functionally stable or functionally able to move or has never been in, in that situation with a brace on or after surgery or whatever whatever the case may be whether it's concussion whether it's anything um, like then we should take her through some functional movements or we should just have her do some movements without a ball and limit her on what she's doing and slowly get her back into it so she feels comfortable so that mentally she's been rehearsing really um, before she's just thrown into a situation and she does feel comfortable and I think that 
that's like the biggest thing with rehab is like yes the physical aspect of rehab is huge but the mental aspect of are you in a mental place where you are ready to get on that court and play and if they're not how can we get you there um, and whether you have a healthcare professional and staff or not um, consulting people and hey how can we work with this kid I don't know I just think that's really really critical in rehab no I think you're exactly right and Every player wants to get back as soon as possible, right? So as a coach, we've got to be looking at them and using kind of our judgment, right? Kid's been out for X amount of time. Even if uh, she comes back and says, my, my PT says, or my doctor says, I'm full go. Okay, well, that's great. You've been doing nothing yeah. for X amount of time. You don't go from doing nothing to doing a complete practice today because you're, that's not what full goal means. Yeah. Full goal means, according to your medical professional, that you're fully able to do all the activities that we're, we do in volleyball, right? Theoretically. Well, then we've got to put this kid in, in kind of elementary situations and like Tanner's talking about, kind of build them back into what they're doing understanding that they've been out for X amount of time. So they shouldn't be coming back in at what everybody else is doing. They should be coming in at some percentage off of what everybody else is doing, whether that's 50%, 30%, 25%, it's gonna depend on a lot of things. And we'd wanna be seeking some information from their healthcare professional as to, give, to guide us. You know, They can do 25% of practice tonight, they can do 50%, whatever. Um, but if we get none of it, then we should be thinking, well, you know, she's been out for a month. We're going to go three hours pretty hard tonight. We're going to start her off at like 20% of that and let's see how she does, right? And then slowly start building her up. And part of it's going to be on like what you see with her. If she looks tentative, take her out of that situation, right? Don't, don't make her make that call, right? You make that call. You don't look comfortable in that yet. That's okay. Come over here, do some block jumps against the wall. Do some, right? do something like Tanner's saying, lower level functional movement without the ball, <clears throat> and let's go. And you know, part of our philosophy here is if we do have guidance from a medical professional, well, first of all, we always seek it, right? Some, some parents, I'll be honest with you guys, won't give us that permission. So now it's more on us to be very conservative as to how we bring that kid back in practice. <clears throat> If we do have guidelines from a medical professional, then we follow those guidelines. And, we, and the kid has no say in that, right? If, if the, you know, in the past... The parents. <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. Or, or do the parents. Exactly, right? I've, I've had plenty of kids come back and, and they give me permission, parents give me permission to talk to their PT. I describe to the PT kind of what volleyball's like, because oftentimes they don't know. And um, I try and get from them, like, how many times can she jump tonight? Because that's usually, it's usually some knee back or ankle kind of issue that we're dealing with, right? Um, how many jumps can she take tonight? If we're gonna jump 200 times tonight, which is a typical hard practice, right? A kid might take 200 jumps. How much of those 200 jumps can she do? And as soon as you give a PT a number like that, then they can come at you with, oh, well, if she, you know, if you guys are going to jump 200 times tonight, she can do like 20% of that or 25% of that or 30%. What? I give you some number, right? And then I've always had kids out, you know, you're out, you're going to count Jane's jumps, right? And we count the kid's jumps. When she hits that threshold that the PT gave us or the doctor gave us, the kid stops jumping. She's done jumping. I don't care how she feels, right? It's like she's done jumping. The PT usually wants to know wants to evaluate the kid soon after that practice to see how she tolerated that and whether it makes sense to start incrementally increasing that volume, right? So the kid has no say in that, right? We take the load off of her. We count the jumps somehow and we shut her down when she hits that threshold. And, you know, coach, I feel great. That's great. Tell your PT that tomorrow or the next day when you see them and they'll probably say you can do a little bit more next time, but we're not going to do more tonight, right? And I really believe that if we can, can manage this environment well, that we can actually help kids learn how to deal with injuries in the most productive way, really setting them up for the future, you know, and just understanding how to manage themselves when they are injured in the future, because 
the likelihood is high that injuries in sports are going to happen, right, to some degree. So, this is good, yeah? Anything else about our, the role we play in managing this environment with injury? I think going along with mental prep, like when they do come back, it's okay to like mentally prepare them that they're not the same player that they were before. You've been out for a month, two months, three months, so we're gonna go and see how it feels and like let's not expect to be where we were when we were training five days a week and that's okay and just to kind of help frame them before they come back to play is helpful. And I, and I think that in not letting a player just kind of go dive headfirst into into training or playing again right after an injury, even after they've been released, that's going to pit us as the bad guy sometimes. So we have to be able to explain this, yeah. explain what we're talking about to the player, to the parents, to the team, even if they have questions about that. So yeah. it's really important that we are able to talk about this with them and allow them to understand that we're not doing this, this is not a punishment. You, even though you're cleared, um, you know, we got to get you back in the in the best way possible. Right. Or you're not going to get re-injured. So we have to be able to explain that to anyone who might have questions. No, that, those are great points, you know. So I'm going to take <clears throat> what you two just said and, and kind of kind of paint a big or put a big circle around all these specific things and say as coaches, we've got to be very proactive with an injured athlete, right? Like really taking the lead on things, getting information from parents slash medical professionals, um, going, diving in and explaining to the team, like you guys have said, ex explaining to the player that you're probably not gonna be, and that's okay, that for a little bit, you're not gonna be as good. And even though you explain it to the kid, you know, when your top hitter who's out for a month comes back and it's negative for a week, it's gonna like really shake her up, right? And you've gotta be with her, like letting her know, hey, I expect this, I, this is normal. I, I gotta tell you, one of the most powerful words I think I've found with athletes is, this is normal, right? It's like, everybody goes through this, because when a kid's injured for the first time especially, and she's coming back off an injury and she starts playing poorly, she thinks, I'm the only one coming off an injury who's awful. But as soon as you can, you know, and the longer you guys coach, right, like Steve and I, you can say, I've had tons of kids coming off injuries, and they all were awful, you know, when they came back. And just, and all of a sudden the kid's like, oh, really? Really? That's, that's how it goes? Yeah, that's how it goes, you know, and help them just accept that to the standpoint that it's going to be a transitional thing. It's not, you're not going to be here forever, you know what I mean? It's, you're too good, you've got, you know, you're working too hard, you know, I'm supporting you through this. I mean, just helping the kid kind of accept where they are and then see it as a, as a transitional or a temporary phase as opposed to they'll immediately think, this is my new level of play, right? And it's really not. So, so we can draw a big circle around this whole idea and it's just us being very proactive and always checking in with kids, even if they look like they're fine, right? Even if they seem to be handling it well, you know, I've always got to remind myself to keep checking with her, keep checking with her, keep checking with her. She seems fine, but I got to keep checking with her because you don't know when they might hit one of those kind of sticking points in their recovery. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also think it's useful if you're in the club situation where you know if you've got a younger player having those anxieties. If you're able to say, well, take a look at so and so on black when she was in her sophomore year, she did her ACL. Look at her play now. And invariably, that's the situation with somebody on black, that they've gone through some sort of trauma at some point during their career. And you're able to use that as an example of somebody getting through it and give them the encouragement that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Because sometimes they don't believe us as, we, as adults. Here's line to me. This isn't what everybody goes through. But the things we're talking about now, one of the things that's striking me is that one of the mistakes that, say, um, the coaches, teammates, etc., can make 
is to be too positive and not allow the player to express her worry, her concern, her fears, and being able to, to express it and say, that's normal too. Yeah, that's a good point. It is also really important. <coughs> that's a really good point. A kid's out, she would, we would expect her to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. We would expect her to be sad and you know feel these ways, right? So um, this is expected, it's okay, it's, I, I didn't know if you were gonna say, don't use the word normal, Jim, but you know, just mm -hmm. put it another way, right? Everybody goes through this, right? It's like, this is what happens yeah. when people get hurt and they're on a team, right? You okay. might feel some of these things. The word I'd like to add to that top category is scared. Yeah. We don't have that up here. And that's, that's a good one. Yeah. And I think another one is, like, especially when they're coming back, is, like, almost shocked at, like, how low level they are or maybe how, like, yeah. um, scared they are to, to go for it or something with an injury. Um, because, like, if you've had a player that is one of the more competitive kids on your team, who's a starter, they're off for X amount of time and they're watching um, somebody come in who is maybe tentative and um, is making mistakes that maybe that player wouldn't have made. She's thinking, man, I would have gone for that. Man, I wish I was on the court. I would have made a kill there and they're they're thinking as soon as I get on the floor, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and it's going to be great and and that's just not reality. So. No. And they're not going to know it until they're faced with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we're not having this discussion to say we can avoid all of these things with players. This discussion is really about we expect players who are injured to go to these places, they're going to go to them at varying degrees, right, and hold on to them or go through them and for varying lengths of time. We just want to basically manage that these things are going to be happening. One, because we're going to expect it, right, and we're just going to work to manage it. Not, <clears throat> not to say that we can erase all that stuff, we've got to handle it. we just got to handle it, you know, and players are going to handle these kind of situations very differently. So. That's the thing that you don't know. Yeah. Right. The other thing striking me here is because we've kind of talked around this and talked about it a little bit, is that the parents will feel sometimes most of these things as well. Some That's parents important. have their own athletic backgrounds, but yeah. we'll be dealing with parents who are new to all of this as well. And parents that might have been um, the athletes themselves that were in a different environment, right, where they were like encouraged to like play through it. Yeah. And mm -hmm and all that, so they might be thinking that's what their kid should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, it's, and we're not saying that players shouldn't play through some things, right? And this is where it gets really tricky. You know, I always look at it like there's a difference between being hurt and being injured, right? You can go to the floor hard for a ball, smack your hip or smack your shoulder, right? Man, that, that stings, that stings, and it's going to affect my mechanics for maybe a day or two, right? Because it stings when I do that thing. Well, I'm hurt, but I'm not injured. I haven't torn anything, I haven't pulled anything, I haven't, you know, I haven't done anything that isn't gonna get better on its own in the next 48 to 72 hours, right? But when a kid, you know, something's been lasting a week or more, well, now we're looking at the kid might be injured. Right, and there's degrees of injury. Tanya, you jump in here if I speak out of tune, right? But um, a, a tendon or a ligament that's starting to get inflamed can get managed pretty quickly if we jump on it right away. But if we are just kind of playing through that pain for weeks, well, now we're looking at, well, gosh, now to fix it, the kid might be out for a month or more. I mean, in general. Am I talking? Yeah. Um I think you're kind of touching on the whole tendonitis to tendinosis thing. So, yeah. like for example, someone who has rotator cuff inflammation or rotator cuff tendonitis, uh, if they keep playing through just that soreness and that pain of that inflammation and in that tissue, you can actually start to see degenerative changes that are really um, you can't. <laughs> yeah, you can't 
change it back to the way it was. So um, just really being on top of resting and um, exercising and making sure biomechanically that they're good so that it doesn't happen again, which is something that Kelly Starrett, Star I always mess up his name, but talking about how pain is an indicator that a whole system has broken down and that's what's leading to the pain. So figuring out what system is broken down and the movement pattern that's kind of causing the issue um, is like really important. So, And we don't, want, we don't want kids to think that shoulder pain, back pain, knee pain is just uh, an outcome of practicing hard. Yeah. That's not, I mean, pain in joints is serious. Yeah. We've got to take it serious, right? It doesn't mean necessarily got to shut a kid down, but if I get a kid with shoulder pain and she's got, and she's reporting shoulder pain to me on a continual basis, well then like, like Tanner's saying, I got to be looking at her mechanics hard and I got to be decreasing her volume, right? Because high volume is just going to do, just going to do bad things to that tissue over time, especially with joints, you know, now a kid hits the floor hard and not a joint is hurting, right? I'm bruised, I'm scraped up, whatever. Well, now that kid's hurt, she's not injured, right? But pain inside of joints, we need to take really seriously, and we always take swelling seriously. Swelling is, a, is an indicator that a kid probably shouldn't be playing or practicing, right? Unless we've got some kind of guidelines about what she's doing. Yeah. I think it's really tricky with younger players because they sometimes don't know like if sometimes they're just like my legs hurt and yeah. you're like what does that mean yeah. Yeah. <laughs> does that mean you're sore for the That's first time yeah. does that mean you're injured and they have a hard time really describing it so it does get really tricky um so being able to have like a pt look at it is really helpful Exactly, because that, because that can alleviate everybody's concerns, right? Player doesn't know whether to be concerned or not, and neither do we because they can't describe it very well. And you don't want kids running with, you know, every, you know, hangnail to see a doctor, right? Um, but we also have to be conservative enough that, you know, what you're describing and how you're moving doesn't look quite right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe you should see you know, or like, you know, if Tanner's available, at least get a first look mm -hmm. from him, right? Because I, you know, I know it's a lot of work for you, Tanner, but I think you're a good kind of first eval, right? It's like, mm -hmm. this is nothing to really be that concerned about, or you know what, this, we need to be concerned about this, you need to go see somebody else, mm -hmm. because this might be a, a potentially, it might be an injury, you know? Mm -hmm. We don't know, and you're exactly right, young kids don't know, so we've got to be very observant looking at what they're doing, how they're moving, what's going on. If they look like something's tender, something's probably tender. If they look like they can't explode, it's because something's going on. Something doesn't feel right, you know? And then there's the other end of the spectrum kid who is just so, has got uh, the real ability to block pain out, and they're not moving well, and you do you feel okay? I feel fine. And they don't look like they feel fine, but they won't report anything to you, and they may not feel that they're feeling any pain. Those, those kids really need to be watched because they can take themselves into injuries pretty, pretty easily. So again, you know, we can't, we've got to try and teach kids how to give us information, but we also got to use our eyes and, you know, and plenty of parents I've called and I would say, hey, you know what, your daughter didn't look that explosive tonight. I think there's something going on. I had a kid years ago, won't use her name. and. Um, Blue Ranko last part of the high school season, and we were in February, March. It was a pretty bad sprain, like second degree sprain. We were in March, and she still was not very explosive. And I would talk to her, and it feels fine, it feels fine, it feels fine. And I'm like, okay. And I finally called her dad, and I said, something's going on because she's too good an athlete, and she's too tough a kid. She was a tough kid. <clears throat> she is not doing the things that I've seen her do before. And he goes, man, she's not telling me anything. I said, well, I get it. She's, she's telling me she feels fine. Took her to a doctor, immediately shut the kid down. She had some bad situation inside her ankle, couldn't play the rest of the year. But she had played for three months in what must have been an incredible amount of pain, but she wasn't playing very well, right? I, I'd seen her lose some dynamic ability in her game. so. We can't trust the players that they don't know a lot of times. You know, the kid never been injured before that spring ankle or senior year, right? So 
they don't know. So we've got to use our eyes and talk to parents and, you know, have them kind of get checked out sometimes. And a lot of times, like you were talking about, they, they're they always in pain. Like, that's just yeah. normal <clears throat> because, you know, they're 15 and they're 6'3". Like, yeah. it makes sense yeah. that you're in pain. <laughs> like, you just grew five inches and things are out of whack. But, like, that's, they're just so used to it and they think it's so normal. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's, this is a hard, this is a tricky thing. We just got to be very aware, and very proactive in the whole environment, you know. We don't want to make kids softies, right, but at the same time, it's not okay to turn off the pain indicators, you know, and say, just work yourself through it, right? There's a huge gray area here that we're trying to navigate as coaches, and we need to be responsible with this, you know. Um, I just want to get through, like, one more point. Well, I thought it was interesting when they talk about how they, the author is thinking that, you know, the part of what's maybe changing or what's so sensitive in the current environment right now is the, the growth of youth competitive athletics, right? Where kids are used to more support and this whole deal. And uh, so maybe now there's less tolerance <clears throat> for coaches that are, you know, hard ass coaches or abusive coaches. Um, one of the interesting things I thought that they put down in here, uh, he starts listing off the ACHA assessment found that 41% of athletes had, quote, felt so depressed that it was difficult to function, end quote, and 52% had felt overwhelming anxiety, uh, with the figures for women jumping to 45%, 59% re respectively. This, like, um, talked to me specifically about some of the stuff that Martin Seligman you know, PhD in educational psychology was writing about in the 90s. And, you know, his whole hypothesis, the way I understand it, is that in education, there was this huge move towards building players' self esteem by basically awarding them for everything that they did, right? And his, his hypothesis was that that is actually going to create the opposite thing that we want to do in kids. People had that thought thinking that this is going to make really resilient kids if, you know, if everything this kid does, I tell it's the best in the world, you know, and always trying to bolster their self-esteem, then they're going to become super resilient and super powerful and just be able to conquer anything. And Seligman's point was this is going to have the exact opposite effect <clears throat> than what we think it's going to have. It's actually going to create people highly, um, highly susceptible to depression and anxiety because they don't really know how to navigate the trials, the everyday trials of the world because everything they're doing is great. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely a population of kids that are like this, you know? So we're really navigating tricky waters here. We have to understand that some kids have been told in their education and at home, because parents, some parents think this is the best way to raise their kid, right? That you know, we're going to move every obstacle out of your way so it's smooth going the whole time and we're going to make a big deal about everything that you do. And then you come into the world of competitive athletics and all of a sudden, you know, your best might not be good enough. And you might have to work three times harder than you've ever worked before just to be average, right? And this can really shake up their world. And as I read this section of the, art of the, mag of the magazine article, I thought, you know, this is this culture of kid that Seligman was afraid was going to be created, and this is what they look like in competitive athletics. Can you share any kind of background on that whole, that whole idea, that whole interplay of you know what went on in education and how it's what, how it's created these kind of kids that have learned to be helpless in situations. Sure, a couple, a couple of things. One is um, the standard conversations we have about pendulum swing one way and then they swing the other way. Yeah. So it's part of the pendulum swinging too far in one direction, or like a rebound from from parents who were maybe like too hard or too disinterested yeah. um, to being overly interested and overly concerned and um, all of that. Interestingly, when you're talking about Martin Seligman, he is one of the, I'll say, one of the fathers of positive psychology. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so his take on it is worth paying attention to because he's after people being resilient, people being capable, people performing well. Yeah. That's and and, and people being and being leading, balanced, 
uh, balance good lives. Yep. So that's part of what he's after. Uh, so it really is worth paying a lot of attention to what to what he's saying. Um, the other uh, another person, Carol Dweck, PhD from in education from Stanford, wrote the book Mindsets and talked about the difference between having a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And she's talking about the same kinds of things that uh, that ultimately. Yeah, the kinds of competitions where everybody gets a gold star, uh, the gold star becomes meaningless. Yeah. And so you don't get what you're really after. When you start uh, really focusing on, uh, on, on being specific about what you're praising and what you're criticizing, so, so that you're really doing it purposefully, you're not just saying you're great at everything, but rather giving feedback that the player can accept as real is crucial. So when the player is making good effort and you comment on the effort, not the outcome, then you're on track. If they create a good outcome, you comment on that. If their attitude is good, you comment on that. So you're finding the kinds of things that will help the player become resilient, become even better, and you're you're motivating her with those things. So it's a I think it's a tricky part of coaching nowadays that yeah. we're we don't have that many role models. Maybe the I'll say older style coaching was um, mostly about criticizing what's wrong, and um, and the pendulum maybe swung too far the other way. The interview with John Sparrow was really interesting because he's like right on target with the way he's coaching. He's saying it doesn't do any good to so it's like you just hammer away on what the kids are doing wrong, what my players are incapable of doing. And I really need to pay attention to what my goals, intentions are for my players, for my team at this point in time, and have all of my comments directed toward that. So and the, the basic point can be something like, uh, we put additional pressure on the players if we talk to them about how talented they are and how much potential they have, and we take that pressure off and give them something they can really work on when we praise their effort, their attitude, the kinds of things that are in their control. Yeah. That's a great point, you know, and, and this whole idea of fixed mindset versus, um, what's the other term? Growth growth mindset, think about it with injured players as they're coming back. <clears throat> as they start experiencing the struggles of coming back, what they are afraid of is this will be a fixed thing. You know, oh my gosh, this is my level of play. It'll always be a level of play. It won't get any better, right? They're worried about coming back to that level. So we've got to let them understand this is a temporary thing and not let it become a fixed thing in their mind, right? Because that's the big worry that's going to happen. And, and then Tim's making a right on point, I think, that we've got to be very careful how we praise kids because if we're praising their talent, right? Oh my gosh, you've got a lot of talent, you've got a lot of potential. You know, what is that? What is that, right? Like that says you've got X, so you're going to be this good. And you might be able to touch 10 6, but it doesn't mean you're going to be a great volleyball player. It means you can touch 10 6, right? That's all it means. But you've got to work really hard to like improve in the areas that need improvement to become a good player, right? So um, yeah, really being careful about what we're praising. Um, last thing I want to say here about this stuff, and we'll save that discussion for next week. Um, so we've talked a lot about the environment we want to create with injured players, and it really is an environment that we want to create with all players on our team, right? But injuries denote like a little, there's some special circumstances here that I want us to be aware of. Any player on your team can feel any of those ways during any part of the season and not be an injured player, right? And you and you can see it if you look for it, you can see them starting to separate themselves, feeling like they're not a part, right? Getting frustrated with their level of execution or their progress or I mean it can happen anyway, right? So us being proactive in what we're doing with each individual player is important and us creating an environment that is respectful, right? And I thought it was a great point in here somewhere it says that, you know, kids have to know that they have value inside of the organization and the team. 
The only way that they're really going to feel, well, there's lots of ways they can feel it. One way they can feel it is through how we interact with them. You know, if, if we believe a kid has value, then my interactions with her will be real interactions, you know, and it's like uh, any kid, right, who's a low-level performer at this point is going to feel, could feel any of those ways up there we have about an injured player. But if I'm interacting with that player as the coach, and if I'm involved with that player, and if I'm seeing progress in that player, even though that progress maybe doesn't get her up to my top um, players at this point, still she's going to feel value, right, in the process that we're engaged in here. And she's going to feel like, oh my gosh, it's like I am important to what's going on here. So it's important that we're, that we're creating an environment like this with our players. So we want it, it's a respectful environment and we can always respect how hard somebody works. We can always respect the fact that people come here every day. I mean, it takes effort to be here every day. You know, a kid who's not playing much, you can respect that in her, right? She's coming here to like work to get better. Um, and then uh, the other thing I think is important, and we'll end with this idea, is that having an environment that is interactive, so like one of the things I always do with my teams is that, especially when I have a bunch of new kids coming to me like I had a couple years ago, I said to them all, I said, I want you to ask me questions. I want you to understand why we're doing this and ask me, why are we doing it this other way, Jim? I want to know that you're thinking about the game. I, I'm never going to tell you guys something's right and something's wrong in volleyball because there's lots of ways to play volleyball. There's lots of ways to play volleyball well. The only things that are wrong are things that could take us into injuries, right? But I've made decisions about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it because I think in some way it gives us an advantage that I want us to have. It doesn't mean some other way is wrong. It just means I've chosen as the coach to say that I'm going to choose this technique over that technique. I think we're going to gain some advantage using this technique that this other technique doesn't give us. This other technique is fine and people use it and people teach it and that's fine, but I think we're going to get some advantage and maybe a, a microscopic advantage, but I think an advantage exists here, right? Because we want players, think how we want players leaving the organization. We want them, you know, not just highly skilled and resilient and great competitors, but we want them highly intellectual volleyball players, right? We want them understanding there's different techniques for blocking and digging and passing and swinging and hitting and serving. There's different tactical considerations in all these things. And coaches get to kind of choose what those are, right? Because they're making, they're weighing the same things. You know, well, I want this advantage versus that advantage, right, with this technique. So we want them like be real intelligent about that kind of stuff so hopefully they can go on to college and maybe further and have really intellectual discussions with their next coaches about, you know, if a player can understand what advantage a coach wants, then that player might be able to say, you know, coach, I know you teach this. I learned this other thing and I think the way I do this other thing might get the advantage that you're trying to create. But the players have to understand what advantages and what give and take coaches are trying to get for the things they're choosing, right? And um, it was funny because, you know, Jordan was always asking me why we were doing things. Always. And a lot of kids wouldn't ask, but they were all listening to my answer, right? Because they wanted to know. They also wanted to know why. And it was great because she, um, she would not, challenge is too strong a word, but she always felt comfortable asking me why are we doing this and not that. You know, and that's really how we want players to be. We want them to be comfortable asking the question why, and we want to be comfortable giving them the information why. You know, and we want our players to have whys. We don't want our players just being robots out there doing stuff the way we're telling them to do it. You know, and it, and it looks differently at 15s and it does at 13s and it does at 18s, right? It's like, just think about that. I mean, how can you create these environments where there's more interaction, right? And like when I've got a particularly quiet group on 18-1, a lot of times we'll be doing something, we'll be working hard at it, something I really believe in, but I can see by how they're doing that maybe they haven't been exposed to this particular thing that we're doing technically or tactically. And I'll bring them in and I'll say, any questions? And they'll, no. And I'll say, well, you know, when I've done this with teams in the past, I've had players ask me why, blah, 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 blah. Anybody had that question? That 
yeah, I do. Oh, well, why didn't you ask me that? You know, come on, you know, it's like, let's, let's have a discussion. Let's have a dialogue about this a little bit, right? Um, so to me, like, that's an important element of the environment that we want to that we want to try and create with players we want them to be dialoguing and thinking and wondering and you know why this and not that you know why this and not that you know it's, it's okay it's great I think it's uh, it's an environment that we want that we want to develop and create and foster and you know really uh, it's an important element I think in somebody's development so we'll end with that thought <laughs>